Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art, and we're going to be reading again from our book, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution, written by Arthur Tamplin and John Goffman. We are on page 167 in Chapter 7, Chapter 7 is titled Nuclear Reactors. The subtitle that we're on is called Fermi Accident uh, Exceeded Maximum Limits. So I'm going to take my glasses off so I can actually bring the book close to my eyes. <sighs> Luckily, when they did begin to manipulate the reactor core, nothing serious happened. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief. But the final investigation of the accident at Fermi indicated that what had happened exceeded the maximum credible accident which had been proposed in the hazard analysis report submitted prior to the construction of the reactor. Officials are again about to restart the Fermi reactor. In the process of reloading fuel rods, they recently had a sodium explosion. For some reason, the AEC and engineers who call this reactor baby are continuing their efforts to restart it. Considering its closeness to Detroit and its catastrophic beginning, one wonders why. Why are our technologists so arrogant, and why are the citizens of Detroit so complacent? We see here the effect of the gallant night. As Federal Power Commissioner Baggy stated, we put the lion's share of our nation's research and development funds into fission reactor, and today we know that it was a mistake. Because of the failure of nuclear reactors to meet their over-optimistic projections, fossil fuels will represent the backbone of the electrical power industry for at least the next two or three decades. It is essential that we spend the funds to make fossil fuel plants as pollution-free as possible. Right. New subtitle. And it's actually the last subtitle of this chapter. Fusion Energy, the Promise of the Future. Moreover, we should stop dotting the landscape with these experimental nuclear reactors. Such experimentation should be cautiously conducted in remote areas, not 30 miles from large population centers. Our coal reserves alone are more than sufficient to see us through a safe development period. Many have expressed doubts as to whether fission reactors will ever represent an acceptable answer to our electrical power needs. The problems associated with disposing of their radioactive waste constitute a strong argument against them. The projected principal power source of the future is the fusion reactor. Some of the more recent estimates suggest that a successful fusion reactor can be developed within the same time period as that required for the fast breeder reactor. In the presence of a fusion reactor, the fast breeder would be obsolete. The present nuclear reactors and the fast breeders are looking more and more like a potentially dangerous lame duck technology. If these fission reactors aren't exploited quickly, they will most likely never be used. So I guess they got, that's one piece of advice they took from Emma. Fusion power makes use, I'm sorry, fusion power makes use of the nuclear reactions that are occurring in the sun. The nuclei of the lighter atoms, such as hydrogen isotopes, are fused together to form heavier atoms. By this process, large amounts of energy are released. Besides being intrinsically much safer, fusion reactors will produce millions of less times radioactivity than fission reactors. Fusion power research has been supported by some $25 million a year, while fission reactor research has received between $400 million and $500 million a year. Wow. Three actions would be necessary, excuse me, three actions would appear to be necessary. One, the construction of the experimental fission reactors should be stopped. Two, the pollution from the fossil fuel plants 
should be drastically reduced. And three, fusion reactor research should be given a much larger share of our national energy research and development dollars and manpower. Well, you know what they say about shoulds. Shoulds never work. Wow. That's the end of Chapter 7, you guys. Now we are on Chapter 8. <laughs> Undisposable radioactive waste. Oh, yeah. We know where this is headed. We're all screwed. We know what that means. I mean, I think that the AEC took um, Tamplin and Goffman, and, and it was kind of like everything they suggested, they they didn't do, and everything they said they shouldn't do, they did do. Uh, kind of like what's going on with the Obama thing right now in Congress. Like, they just, such freaking racist. Like, they're not going to let him do anything even if they want it. You know, even if it makes sense. Just because he's a black man, and they're not going to let a black man help America. And that's just the way it is, right? So, anyways, uh, back to the book. Number eight, undisposable radioactive waste. One of the major legacies of the nuclear age is radioactive waste. No shit. Discussion concerning the disposable, disposal of radioactive wastes are misleading because these wastes are not disposable. Let's read that again. Discussions concerning the disposal of radioactive waste are misleading because these wastes are not disposable. They must be kept isolated from the environment and therefore, quote, guardianship of nuclear waste, unquote, is a more meaningful concept. We are producing waste products that must be maintained in isolation from the environment for a thousand years or more. Wow. Guarding this radioactive garbage is one of the prices that future generations will have to pay, in addition to the genetic consequences they will suffer from the radioactivity which we are presently introducing into the environment, either deliberately or under the guise of waste disposal. I think I'm going to be cussing in this chapter, you guys. In the 1950s and the early 1960s, the great superpowers, the United States and the USSR, tested nuclear weapons in the atmosphere representing some 300 to 400 megatons of TNT equivalent of nuclear fission type bombs. The concern over the long-lived radioactive byproducts Cesium-137 and strontium-90 resulting from these explosions was enough to touch off a worldwide controversy. So wasn't it cesium-137 that uh, Catherine Higley said that's why we test for cesium-137 because it's one of the fastest disappearing isotopes from Fukushima? And here he is, a real scientist calling this long-lived radioactive byproducts. The cesium and strontium have, intru have introduced a biological hazard to the, ha to the environment. And as a result, almost every living person carries both of these radionuclides in such, in such tissues as muscle and bone. Our foodstuffs, grown on soil contaminated with both of these long-persisting nuclides, are regularly and essentially universally contaminated by them. The Atmospheric Nuclear Test Ban Treaty has cut down the introduction of more of these poisons, at least for the two superpowers and the other signatories to this treaty, which, by the way, uh, Israel never did, and we don't know what they were, what they have been doing. It's re and really, they're just an arm of the United States government. Clearly, the radioactivity from 300 to 400 megatons of nuclear fission bombs was worrisome to the world. A large nuclear electric plant producing a thousand megawatts of electric power uses the same amount of uranium in one year as a 25 megaton uranium fission bomb. What? A large nuclear react, uh, excuse me, a large nuclear electric plant 
producing 1,000 megawatts of electrical power, uses the same amount of uranium in one year as a 25 megaton uranium fission bomb. And this means the production of strontium-90 and cesium-137 and other radioisotopes equivalent to that produced, produced in such a 25 megaton bomb. As a consequence, those nuclear power plants, which are already on order, will produce 10 times as much radioactivity each and every year as was produced by all the superpower atmospheric weapons testing. Okay, I'm reading that one again so it'll sink in. As a consequence, those nuclear reactor, those nuclear power plants, which are already on order and frankly by now 2015 have already been built, will produce or have produced 10 times as much radioactivity each and every year as was produced by all the superpower atmospheric weapons tests. Holy fuck. By the year 2000, this is projected to grow to 100 times as much radioactivity as the weapons tests. Unless this material is isolated from the biosphere, we could, over a period of very few years, or even each year, release more radioactivity to the environment than was released in all the weapons tests combined. Think of that little dot that animated where all the weapons tests were bombing. Wow. Unfortunately, the evidence to date indicates that appreciable quantities of this reactor radioactivity will find its way into the environment and man. Everything but the squeal. That's the new subtitle. Quote, everything but the squeal. S-Q-E-A-L. Squeal. Squeal. S-Q-U-E-A-L. Skewel. Everything but the skewel. That must mean something. I don't know that word, you guys. As we indicated earlier, the gallant knight of the nuclear industry is promoting not only its major product line, but is also promoting its byproducts. Consider the 1969 report of the Atomic Energy Commission, the nuclear industry, in which the following can be found. Quote, Useful byproducts from reactor waste. Fission products such as strontium, cesium, and promethium recovered during irradiated fuel processing operations are already finding some useful commercial applications such as industrial thickness gauges, food irradiators, teletherapy units, as a power source in remote weather stations, etc. Others, such as xenon, krypton, rhodium, and palladium, are being considered for recovery because of their potential use in the electrical, jewelry, oil, and chemical industry. Possible markets for the expanded use of these materials in the near future offer many challenging opportunities. Late in 1968, the AEC announced that the Richland Operations Office would seek expressions of interest from industry in the recovery of fission products, rhodium, palladium, and technitium, technitium, T-E-C-H-N-I-T-I-U-M, technitium, technitium, that's how I say it. From the Hanford High Level Waste. Okay. Late in 1968, the AEC announced that the Richland Operations Office would seek expressions of interest from industry and the recovery of fission products, rhodium, palladium, and technidium from Hanford High Level Waste. Considerable interest was indicated by several firms, and one, PPG Industries, is exploring the possibilities of recovering these fission products by a proprietary, pro proprietary process 
using a sample of the Hanford waste. A particular interest in the byproduct category is Neptunium, which is used as, a tar as the target material in the production of Plutonium-238. It is possible that at some future date there will be a very large demand for Plutonium-238 for the use as a power source in our space program. And also there could be large demands for the artificial heart program if it is successful. General Electric is now offering to recover Neptunium as well as uranium and plutonium from irradiated nuclear fuel in its chemical reprocessing plant being constructed at Morris, Illinois. Fucking General Electric, man. These people are fucking evil. Nuclear Fuel Services, Inc., New York State Atomic and Space Development Authority and all other companies with interest in the chemical reprocessing business are giving serious consideration to this and other isotopes for which a market and economic conditions justify recovery. Wow. There are about a hundred private firms that produce radioisotopes or convert them into products for medicine, science, and industry. I mean, remember, this is 1970, folks. Imagine what it is today. Total sales of these companies are estimated at, five, at $53 million annually, consisting of about $8 million in basic radioisotope materials, $16 million in radio, radiochemicals, $25 million in radiopharmaceuticals, and $4 million in radiation services. In addition, sales of devices in which Radioisotopes are employed total about $40 million a year. If the sales of the products produced by radiation processing, auxiliary materials, and services related to radioisotope and radiation uses are included, the total commercial activity in the United States is at a level of several hundred million dollars annually. Unquote. That's from the AEC. These people have no soul. A very large fraction of these isotopes will eventually find their way into the environment via, via sewers and garbage heaps. Much of this radioactivity will, as, as has already occurred in 1970, find its way into the environment through transportation accidents. Moreover, some shipments will simply be lost in transit and some will be misplaced and forgotten. Some of the broken, misplaced, and forgotten radioactive products will produce serious immediate consequences. As an example, we can cite the case of a young Mexican boy who found cobalt, a cobalt-60 source. The source, highly radioactive, looked to him like a metallic marble, and he put it in his pocket. The radioactivity subsequently made him ill, and his mother put him in bed. She put the marble in a drawer in the kitchen. As a consequence, both the mother and the boy's little sister became ill, and the maternal grandmother came to care for them. The final result was that all four died. Other such tragic examples are available. However, it is important to recognize that the hidden genetic consequences of the introdu introduction of this radioactivity to man's environment will pale by these examples by comparison. Undoubtedly, there are some necessary applications of radioisotopes, but one thing is certain. We do not need a, quote, gung-ho, unquote, radioisotope industry. And the industry, which we presently have, needs to be more stringently regulated. Well, I'm going to stop here. We're on page 173, and we're on chapter 8, which is called Undisposable Radioactive Waste. And we're at the new subtitle, uh, Fuel Reprocessing Plants and Waste, quote, Disposal, unquote. Wow. The complete disregard for real science by the atomic energy industry and the capitalists. I mean, the AEC is sitting there saying how the millions of dollars a year that it's going to provide us without a single regard for the damage to our entire environment. 
It's unconscionable. Uh, no wonder they're lying about Fukushima. I mean, no wonder they lie about all the nuclear radioactivity. Because they've already fucked us a long time ago, man. This is like, we're just waking up. Like, seriously, battered wives. That's what we are, battered wives. And we're just like fucking big black guys. And we've got strangle marks around our neck. And we're laying in the hospital going, you know what? If I don't leave that bastard, he's going to fucking kill me. And that's where we're at. Only nobody knows about it. What have we got? Maybe 100 people, 200 people listening to this book? We need millions of people in the street, folks. We need people to call up our congressmen, our senators. We, you know, we need to stop the show. This is bullshit what's going on. We're just letting Fukushima rage on. Bringing our kids to the coast, letting them play in the sand, hoping and praying they're not going to be affected. Oh, don't worry, that radiation is not going to harm us. The fucking animals on the beach and the coast are dying and dead. They're, I mean, all, I was thinking about it today. All the crustaceans, all the little tiny creatures at the bottom of the sea, fucking gone, no doubt. Mutating. I hope Helen Caldicott hears this. And I hope that she will put her forces together and get a million people in the street. That's what we need. A million people in the streets in New York City, Washington, D.C., in every capital across the country. We need to shut these motherfuckers down. I'm going to end here. It's almost 22 minutes. So thanks, everybody, for listening and sharing this information and digesting it with me. And thanks for tolerating, like, my attitude on it. <laughs> so put your courage feet on. Obviously, we need them and our thinking caps, you know, and we need to put the, we just need to, like, get strong. And we need to, like, not give up, you know. What that poem say, uh, it's when things, are worse that you must not quit you know I used to know that poem by heart you know and uh, the silver clouds ugh, clouds of doubt silver lining of the clouds of doubt there's got to be a silver lining you know what's one of the silver linings you you guys us connecting building community people who would never connect we're connecting and we're building community. And guess what? It may not feel like we're making an impact. We're making an impact. And we are going to, we're going to coalesce when the shit hits the fan and something really big happens. We will be the ones that people come to and ask us, what do we do? And you know what? Most of us know what to do. And we're already doing it. That's why you're listening to me. That's why you're reading this book with me. So anyways, I really appreciate everybody's love for humanity and love for our planet. And we need to talk about love more and walk in integrity, be who we say we are. And, you know, we don't have to have all the answers, but we do have to have the courage to face it. So, ciao, you guys. Bye.